Thank you. It's a pleasure and a genuine honor to be here with you this evening. I would actually like to start tonight with a joke. It's an old joke. Arguing with a philosopher is like wrestling with a pig in the mud. After a few hours, you realize the pig enjoys it. Now, I can hardly lay claim to being a philosopher myself, but having taught philosophy for the past decade, and having been a student of philosophy since long before that, I can confidently say that this is one thing that I certainly do share with the great philosophers of human history. I enjoy getting down in the mud for a good argument. Indeed, my family are here tonight, and I'm sure that they will be happy to testify to that fact. As this man understood, arguments are wonderful things. Discussions, debates, arguments, these are wonderful things. The thumping heart rate, the surge of adrenaline, the quick-fire retorts and rebuttals, the thrill of landing on that perfect example at just the right moment. When we engage in an earnest exchange of ideas and perspectives, we start to dig a little bit deeper, get a little bit closer, if not to an answer, at least to a better understanding of the question. Arguments are wonderful things. But there are five words which are poison to a good argument. When you hear this ominous phrase, you know that the earnest exchange of ideas is about to be put into grave danger. These are those five ominous words. So what you're saying is, so what you're saying is, so what you're saying is, what invariably follows this line? Think of the last time you heard someone say this in a discussion or a debate. And what followed? Was it a clear, concise summation of your argument? No. Experience tells us that the reformulation of our argument that we're about to bear witness to is at best an oversimplification of the argument that we just laid out. And at worst, it will be a rendition of the argument that is so thoroughly mutilated it couldn't even be identified by its dental records. In special cases, you might even be treated to this six-word variation. So what you're really saying is... The beauty of this formulation is that it boldly presumes that we are incapable of saying what we really mean. Or perhaps even that we're maliciously obfuscating our true meaning. Moreover, it signals that we're in for a treat. We're about to hear a translation of our real meaning. A translation that, let's face it, would probably make Google Translate envious in its ability to cling tenuously to the literal meaning of the original statement, and yet simultaneously transform the substance of it entirely. So, what are we talking about here? What is it quivering on the horizon when, on the horizon when we hear those five fateful words? Well, this phenomenon is common enough, and as this is a room of TOK students, all very well versed in logical fallacies, I think you probably recognize where this is headed. These five words are indeed the common prelude to a straw man argument. You may be familiar with this. A straw man argument is an informal fallacy whereby one deliberately misrepresents their opponent's argument in order to make it easier to attack. Now, before I get too comfortable up here on, on my high horse, it's important to note it is not only other people that commit this fallacy. We're all fallen back on this lazy trope at some point, some argument in our history, possibly earlier today. Whoever the perpetrator is, the signally frustrating thing about the deployment of these straw man armies is that it derails the debate. All the time and energy is now wasted on mischaracterizing each other's arguments or lamely attempting to salvage our own all of which detracts from the primary function of discourse in the first place, which is to develop, through rational debate, a clearer understanding of the relative merits of a set of competing ideas. As Karl Popper noted, the aim of an argument or of a discussion should not be victory, but progress. It is my contention tonight that a key factor in the current unhinged state of the world is our increasing inability to engage in constructive discourse. 
It's abundantly apparent to anyone who has made the foolish mistake of trying to engage in a critical debate on the internet, foolish, I know, that discourse and debate has become much more about winning, about defeating your opponent, than it's been about progress. Well, in a bid to help us reclaim this lofty and noble aim, to help equip you with a means of navigating hostile debates and moving towards a more productive discourse, I present to you tonight the antithesis of the straw man argument. I present the Iron Man argument. Now, before I outline the Iron Man argument, I just want to make, take a moment to elaborate briefly on the problem. We live in what Mark Manson has dubbed the age of outrage. Manson suggests that we've become addicted to our own self-righteous outrage, and in an attempt to satiate our lust for outrage, we willfully and perhaps even sometimes gleefully misinterpret and misrepresent other people's arguments and ideas in order to find for us a new source of disgust and moral indignation. To illustrate this problem, consider how words of wisdom from thinkers throughout human history would be received today in the current climate. Imagine for a moment that Socrates had shared his ideas, not in the ancient Agora, but on Twitter today. Famous line from Socrates here, it's a disgrace for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. Imagine the sorts of replies that such a comment might elicit in the current climate. How swiftly would Socrates be pilloried for his narrow-minded body shaming, labeled a superficial gym bro, accused of self-absorbed vanity? A barrage of straw man armies would descend on that tweet and tear it apart within moments. Now, obviously, to some extent, there's always been a combative element to discourse and debate. I'm not suggesting this is some entirely new phenomenon. However, as ideological tribalism and political polarization have intensified markedly in recent years, the animosity has become increasingly palpable. One need only look at the verbs that are starring in your favorite YouTube titles to get a glimpse of this antagonism. Think about the words that leap out here, these verbs. What we're presented with, destroy, annihilate, shred, crush, eviscerate, this is the language of destruction. These are videos garnering millions of views by predominantly young people across the globe. This, this is the current state of the discourse that is consumed by people imitated by people, a world unhinged indeed. And so, what is the remedy? What can we do? How can we counteract this animosity? How can we return to a state of productive, meaningful, progressive discourse? Well, as with basically all forms of improvement, it starts at home. We must start with ourselves, with the way that we choose to engage in arguments and debate. It's not about putting an end to arguments, but improving the way that we argue. Importantly, the Iron Man argument, the solution that I want to suggest to you tonight, is not a tool for dismantling other people's arguments. It is not some surefire way for you to win your next debate. I'm sorry. In fact, I want to suggest quite the opposite. The Iron Man argument is not about bolstering your own argument at all, but rather it's about refining, rephrasing, patching up, or in whatever way possible, strengthening your opponent's argument. Now, I can see the gears turning in people's minds at this stage. What you're saying is, but be careful, if you're going to say, so what you're saying is we should invest time and energy in helping the person we're debating with to more effectively and efficiently win the argument, then yes, essentially that's correct. But hear me out before you storm out the door. What I have dubbed the Iron Man argument is really an approach to discourse with a very long history in philosophy. It sometimes goes by the name the principle of charity. Ultimately, this is a methodological presumption that we make when engaging in an argument or a discussion, whereby we first seek to understand this view that we're challenging here in its strongest, 
most credible form before we subject the view to appraisal. This is a really important point. We must reframe it in its strongest, most credible form before we're permitted to evaluate the merits of that argument. So here's how it works when you engage in a debate or argument next somewhere out there in the wild. Step one, we momentarily suspend our own beliefs or disbelief as the case sometimes may be. Be open to the possibility that when they claim what, what they claim may be true, however outlandish it may first appear. Now this is a much more challenging step than many people anticipate, but it is crucial as it helps us to avoid slipping into a combative posture from the outset. Step two, we presume the best of intentions. This is sometimes referred to as Hanlon's razor. Now, a common trap in our current mode of discourse is that we so frequently presume malicious intent. Our desire for outrage perhaps fuels this impulse. But it's important that we repress this. We must presume the most noble intent. Step three. Avoid the urge to first hunt for weaknesses. One of our first impulses is to try and spot fallacies and to spot a weakness in an argument. And oftentimes we feel we're being remarkably clever when we dismiss an argument for its use for fallacy. But in reality, I suggest to you that we're simply taking the easy way out of confronting the substance of that argument. And if you really need convincing, remember the fallacy fallacy, which states that it's an error in logic to assume that a conclusion is false simply because it commits a fallacy. Checkmate, fallacy hunters. Step four, in cases of ambiguity in an argument, presume the most cogent meaning for suppressed premises, for missing premises, for confusions of inductive or deductive logic, or simply when somebody uses misleading or inaccurate phrasing, when they don't have the right words. Do your best to fill in the blanks with the most reasonable and logically consistent amendments. And step five, finally, with all of the above taken into consideration, we outline the argument of our opponent as vividly, as fairly and clearly as possible. They should respond to you with, wow, I couldn't have said it better myself. If and only if they're happy with the summation that you've given them, can you proceed with the evaluation, exploring the merits of the argument. This is your starting point for a discussion. Importantly, this approach does not entail ultimately agreeing with the arguments that are presented with you, to you. But it does ensure you are engaging with the argument in its most robust form. In adding this bulletproof layer of iron cladding, we undoubtedly lower our chances of winning the argument. Indeed, we've actively stacked the odds against ourselves but we have gotten much closer to actually gaining something from the debate itself. And ironically, a beneficial side effect of this methodology is that it begets imitation, the charitable act of interpreting someone's argument in the most generous possible way diffuses that simmering animosity, and it often fosters a willingness to return the favor. It has a very potent disarming effect. And so, my challenge to you tonight, then, is to disband the straw man army, stand them down, and adopt instead the Iron Man argument. You will lose more arguments, certainly. Debates will be longer. They will be more difficult, without a doubt. But you will ultimately revive that capacity for a productive discourse. And so the next time you get down in the mud for a good argument and utter that fateful phrase, so what you're saying is, surprise everyone around you. 